All right, glad to have you back. Now, the Federal High Court in Abuja has upheld the validity of the Presidential Executive Order 6, which provides for the interim seizure of assets linked to ongoing criminal trials and investigations. Now, President Muhammad Buhari had on July the 5th, 2018, issued the Presidential Executive Order. The presidency says the cases of most of those affected by the travel ban on 50 prominent Nigerians started before the present administration. Senior Special Assistant to the President on Media and Publicity, Garba Shehu, says the essence of the Executive Order 6 was to make for speedy trials and conclusion of graft cases. Shehu argued that the access to the resources by the suspects had enabled them to be in position of sometime compromise, investigation, prosecution, and even the trial itself. Yeah, but human rights lawyer and senior advocate of Nigeria, Femi Falano, as well as the Socioeconomic Rights and Accountability Project Serap, have come down hard on President Buhari. They have called on the presidency to scrap the travel ban forthwith. Now, describing it as repressive and unlawful. Of course, we still have in the studio to look at the story with us, uh, Barista Jide Olugun. Thank you for staying with us on the show. Thank you and thank and God. Also joining us via Skype from Edo State is Dr. Mati Ayi Bakuro. Uh, he's the Director of Research and Policy, African Network for Environment and Economic Justice. Thank you for joining us on the show. Good morning. Thank you very much. Good to be here. All right, first off, let's know your stance on this Executive Order 6. Are you for it or against it? <laughs> I am broadly for it. Um, I'm broadly for it because we've had a lot of challenges with the anti-corruption regime in Nigeria. There has been a lot of loopholes. And despite the measures that have been put in place since the return to democracy, there are still a lot of loopholes in our laws on how to deal with corruption. And the executive order comes in to, in a certain manner, um, ameliorate some of these loopholes. Um, and if you look at it very technically, and we have looked at it in-house, we've actually put out our position on this, the most of the concerns about the executive order itself are actually safeguards already contained within the order. There is an obvious challenge that this executive order might lead to executive tyranny and overreach of executive powers in a democratic setting. But that is also the same case with any other law or mechanism, which is that we have the courts. And so the executive order allows that anybody who is concerned about the constitutionality or the, the fear that this may challenge human rights and, and separation of powers to go to court to challenges, which people have done already. But we believe that the fact that most accused persons, while their cases are in court or otherwise, still have access to a lot of resources mm. to be able to challenge <laughs> and frustrate judicial processes is a challenge that we need to deal with. But the most important factor in this that we should remember is that it is very unfortunate that when initiatives like this come up, we do not find proper and objective analysis of these issues and they are quickly subsumed into suspicion of the motives of the person putting them in place or otherwise. We need to separate the initiator from the initiative and, and in saying so we need to look at whether or not the executive order itself is something that is necessary. And perhaps more importantly we should also not forget that most of the provisions of that executive order are already subsumed in the laws establishing a lot of anti-corruption institutions like the ESCC. With or without the executive order, the ESCC could still do what it's doing. Sure. The federal government, it appears, has through the executive order made an effort to coordinate the efforts of all law enforcement agencies around issues of corruption, human trafficking, terrorism, to make sure that they are able to coordinate these efforts around the assets of people who are being investigated. That is all the executive order actually does in effect. So it is not something absolutely out of the ordinary or new in terms of the criminal justice system or prosecution of corruption cases. And that objective analysis is seriously lacking in a lot of the views out there, people saying this is about a president trying to bring in dictatorial tendencies from his past. We need to be able to look at it objectively and not politicize things because we've had too many governments in Nigeria trying to fight corruption and no matter what the efforts are, they get lost in these political nuances in Nigeria. Okay. Uh, Judy, let me, let me come to you on this. A lot of lawyers have argued that the, the president 
uh, under the executive arm of government is trying to usurp the powers of the judiciary or the court by someone who you presume to have a case in court or have proceeds from uh, corruption as the case may be, all of those assets will confiscate them one way or the other, will prevent these people from traveling even when the court have not pronounced the person guilty. So how does this contradict? Make us understand. Yeah, I think we have a systemic challenge here. Mm. The fact that the executive order is coming shows weakness in some approaches that okay. we have on ground. Right. But let's be, uh, you know, let's approach it objectively. Mm -hmm. If you look at the 1999 Constitution of Nigeria, you consider Section 15, Subsection 5, that says the state must abolish corruption and abuse of power. Mm -hmm. So the state has a prerogative to abolish and fight corruption. Yes. If you look at the impact of corruption on a society, then you may not be worried that Nigeria is where it is today. Mm -hmm. And having said that, what is an order? An order is an authoritative directive, instruction, that this should be carried out. What is executive? The executive is that arm of government that is mandated to take decisions. All right? And even though our constitution does not specifically make reference to executive order, the president has the prerogative. Mm -hmm. Executive order, if we go to America, the yes. presidential system we have adopted, as far back as 1789, George Washington gave an executive order to the heads of federal departments to come forward with evidence that show that they are really supporting the vision of making America great. I think it was William Harrison, out of all the presidents, that did not even embark on executive orders. This is not the first one. Recently, even the vice president in acting capacity gave an instruction that SARS be restructured and we mm. restructured. I think why this is sensitive is because of the timing mm. and the political interpretation given to it. Mm. Should we fight corruption? Why not? And let me now advise the government. You have the ICPC, the EFCC, the Ministry of Justice. You know, within the executive arm, you are the one to implement. This government came to office on the 29th of May, 2015. Three and a half years down the line, I should be compelled to ask how many of these corrupt personalities have been dealt with with justice? Mm. Is it the same in other parts of the world? My answer is no. I have made reference to South Korea. I have made reference to the UK. We have the Malabu case mm -hmm. that we are still battling with exactly. in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. But There's in so Italy... Years. Yeah. They have jailed some, some. you know, uh, indicted persons. It's just, so it's all a matter of what are we trying to achieve. And do you know why this is sensitively difficult for the government now? Even though they are denying the list, it appears they are going <laughs> after opposition. And if you ask me, if I come out to tell you that I'm fighting corruption, that means I should not befriend anyone who is perceived corrupt. So when you have the likes of Aquabio who are even answering questions with some law enforcement agencies migrating to the same party who is fighting corruption, some people should be allowed to ask questions. Mm. You know, so when you have the case so, of so Abadu the, the perception here matters now. Mm. And you cannot rule out perception. Sincerely speaking, this government enjoyed an overflowing goodwill from Nigerians mm. because of the three capsules of vision okay. to fight corruption, to attend to the insecurity in the country, and to deal with our economy. And let me be objective here. Let me ask, let me start by asking those of us who are in the studio here, what rating do you have for our economy now? We know a lot of efforts are going on. But you see, the difficulty in making promise is that you'll be held accountable, accountable. on the promises you have made. Mm. What is the state of security in Nigeria now? What is the state of our economy? You see? So how far have we gone in fighting the corruption? So these are all the issues. And right now, the Constitution also ensures separation of powers. And even though the court says 
that the president can issue the executive order. Mm. It is still subject to getting the appropriate orders from the court. Mm -hmm. If mm. you are going to prevent people from trying because they have their fundamental human rights. Okay. And if we go by the criminal justice positioning we have for the country, they are presumed innocent. Okay. And that's why you all see right, Dr. lawyers rushing to court now. So we must balance all this. I think what we should do is find a way of making the agencies we have effective. That's okay. where we'll come back to you. Let me right. go to Martina at the point. And that exactly, I hope you heard what the barrister said, what I want to ask you now. Uh, because um, some Nigerians, I don't want to say, oh, now I've been criticizing this, uh, this executive order six. And they are saying that why not strengthen the likes of ICPC, EFCC, instead of putting this kind of order in place. Because Garba Shehu said that some of these cases that have lingered for so many years, from seven to ten years, uh, were even inherited from past administrations. So why not strengthen the judicial system, strengthen the uh, anti-corruption agencies so that they can do the needful and uh, get justice delivered? Yeah, that is, that is a, a very important point. And we've been made, making that point for, well, almost 20 years or thereabout now. The, the arguments are always strengthening the current institutions, make sure they have no money, let the judiciary get into place. We've made those arguments for a very long time, but we are not making very good progress. And I want to emphasize the fact that when these arguments are made and the, the anti-corruption efforts in the country get lost in these nuances of this is partiality, the perception is that you're not going after people in your party, the ordinary Nigerians are the people who ultimately lose in this process. Because we have a certain circle of politicians who are able to move into government and out of government and defect and inflect into other parties and are able to shoot themselves out of all these processes. But then if we Nigerians, the ordinary Nigerians, get caught up in those nuances, then we're not going to go forward with these anti-corruption efforts. Mm -hmm. The EFCC, as you found, I mean, in terms of infrastructure, they have one of the best in Africa, if not the world. They're having a lot of budgetary allocations to them. But we are not making good efforts because the whole anti-corruption effort is getting lost in these arguments of political parties, ethnicity, religion. We need to be able to start looking at initiatives like this objectively. The EFCC already has powers to be able to temporarily keep assets until cases are concluded. The ICPC has similar powers, but this is an effort to make sure that these efforts are all coordinated under the Office of the Attorney General. But a lot of the arguments since the executive order was released haven't been on the content of the order. Like, like my colleague in, the, in, in, in your studio already said, Section 4 of the executive order already says that if the enforcement of this order is in any way endangering your human rights as a citizen, you can go to court. So why don't we look at the content of it and see if we can use this to go over some of the loopholes and challenges that you have also mentioned about threatening to see if we can make some, some, some headway with these processes. And the other point I need to make is that I've looked at a lot of the views expressed on this view by senior colleagues in the profession, lawyers and non-lawyers alike, and a lot of this has been about human rights violation. Everybody talks about the rights of the accused in the criminal system. We all agree that the anti-corruption effort should go on without infringing on the rights of, of citizens, which is fundamental in any democracy. Mm -hmm. But who is talking about the rights of the victims of corruption? Who is talking about the rights of the people who do not get schools, who do not get what they need as citizens of a country because whoever gets the political office gets enriched? I think that the most recent action of, of releasing the fact that the federal government is now banning 50 people from travel is a very unnecessary gimmick, and it, it's, it's just distracting from the effective use of executive order. I mean, most of those people have cases in court, and if the value of those cases are over 50 million, the court would likely even make sure that you drop your passport as part of bail conditions. Mm -hmm. So there was no point to bring in this gimmick in this electoral period. But what I am saying, is that the anti-corruption efforts in this country has often not achieved the purposes. And I, I don't want to make the arguments on the current administration, the one before that, or even the one before that, because we've been going around this circle for so long. Let us look at how initiatives like this can be used to strengthen the anti-corruption drive in Nigeria. But perhaps more importantly, when we make the arguments about the violation of the rights of the accused people, the politically exposed persons who have at their disposal millions and billions of naira to fight cases against them, 
Let us also think about the ordinary Nigerian who didn't get his school or the road built or he helps um, challenges met, which are all human rights by the way, recognized and enforced and should be enforceable in Nigeria and beyond. Who is talking about those rights are infringed because of the mammoth corruption of this country? Mm -hmm. If we continue to make these arguments about this current administration or the past administration or the fact that it is directed at opposition, I don't care if the executive order comes in one day before elections. We should say, is it legal? Is it necessary? Is it important for ordinary Nigerians? Because the governments may continue to change, but the plight of Nigerians remain the same every day. And we should be looking at efforts and initiatives to make sure that we are able to also take the interest of the ordinary Nigerian in consideration during these conversations. Okay. All right. Uh, th these are very sensitive times. Like you were talking about the timing whether Nigerians are comfortable with the timing or uh, the, the coincidence of the timing of the fact that we're getting into elections. This government has been on ground for, for three years and Nigerians expected that when it comes to rolling out plans against corruption, it would have been the best time at that time at the inception. In fact, the first six months where there mm -hmm. were no commissioners, Nigerians were expecting that, that is the time this government would have rolled out all its plan. Now, when it comes to communicating with Nigerians, the, the spokesman of the presidential spokesman has come to say that, that the list you're seeing everywhere is not from us. We're not the ones who give out that list. So whatever it is, whether there's a dead person who is on the list or <laughs> there are people of the opposition or the people of the, that is not from us. But the point there is, if it is, but you didn't come out to doubt the fact that there is actually a ban on 50 people, 50 Nigerians. Do you think there's a communication challenge when government is coming up with these things, not being able to channel it for Nigerians to understand and for Nigerians to accept and support? You talked about the issue of goodwill. Mm -hmm. This government enjoyed maybe one of the best goodwills in the last decades. Do, do you think there's that challenge on how to really communicate this thing rightly to Nigerians for them to buy in? Yeah, you've said it. And, you know, the executive arm is so empowered mm. with resources. The ministries are under the, you know, executive arm. And in communicating, we've had a lot of gaps. In a situation where you are reported as denying almost everything that shows up, it either means you are not proactive and practical enough to present what should be trusted. And you are at the mercy of whatever shows up. You see, so, and that element of being proactive, we need to work on it. I mean, like, like I said, you talk of, you know, I, I'm lost on this matter. Mm. Because by now, this government should be showing the people the great things that have been done in practical forms, rather than claiming 1.7 trillion has been spent on massive infrastructure. Like my colleague mentioned, people want to touch this infrastructure. I will give you an example. There is a short distance between the Ojodubaga bus stop in Lagos and the Kara Bridge towards the Long Bridge. The deadly potholes there, we had to shout on radio everywhere before Somebody came to mend it. I don't know who came. And we have an agency, Federal Road Maintenance Agency, that was put in place, I think, around 2002 to monitor all federal roads in the country and maintain them. So why have we come to where we are? And there are other issues. So if you have the, the, the utensils to communicate and you are not rightly communicating, then why should you blame me? If mm. I'm attacking you mm. for, for not performing. Mm. So mm. it's, it, and even when we come, for example, let's take some communication elements that came out recently. It is from the same government bureau of statistics that you will get to know that our debt profile is 22 trillion naira. Mm. Is that coming from opposition? Mm. That about 10.5 billion children are out of school. Now and about 69% of that are from the children. north that led to UNICEF going there to address the traditional rulers mm -hmm. on the need for Western education, and a group is fighting that education, for us to hear that, you know, so this, all these issues, I think what is needed mostly now 
is coordination. The best time to have planted a tree was 20 years ago. The mm. next best time is now. Is now. People need to be in touch with the results. If there were no promises, then there is no yardstick for okay. evaluation. Yes. And once again, the meaning of executive is that you are to implement mm. plans. So how far have these plans been implemented? By the way, those who are being banned from traveling out of this country, they have remained in this country. Mm. Yes, they have remained in this country. You see? And again, in terms of communication, I think the president also should be careful what he says or whatever he said about him. Recently, he was trying to insinuate that national security supersedes Trump's the rule of law. Mm -hmm. And we all know globally that it is the rule of law that we even facilitate security. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And you look at the different kinds of experiences we are having, a group coming out to threaten state laws, Miyeti Allah, mm -hmm. headsmen killing people, and we have not denied that they are headsmen. Even acknowledging at the international level that foreign invaders are invading Nigeria, Islamic states of West Africa, threatening the sovereignty rebels of the country. from Libya. You see, all these are contrary to the provisions of the Constitution. The Constitution says that the primary assignment of the government okay. is the welfare of the people. Mm -hmm. you know, there are three basic issues to protect the people, provide for the people, and create an enabling environment. And our motto says unity and faith, as mm -hmm. amended in 1978, mm -hmm. unity and faith, peace it's and progress. progress. That means without unity, we cannot have faith in whatever project you are putting in place for Nigeria. And without peace, there cannot be progress. progress. The question we should ask now, objectively and in the fear of God, mm. how do we evaluate the unity of this country currently, the, uh, the faith people have in the project Nigeria currently, the level of peace in this country, then we now talk about the progress. Mm. In 1960, when we gained uh, political independence from the Britons, the population of Nigeria was about uh, 45 million or thereabout. As of 2017, the estimated population is about 190 million. Mm. What capacity have we built to support this progress? So, so I think we should be dealing with economic issues, okay. development issues, and the United Nations has simplified it by coming up with the Sustainable Development Goals with about 17 goals. We can go there, look at those key areas, <laughs> zero tolerance for poverty, yes. education, institutions, you know, and there are platforms for international collaborations. Mm -hmm. And many countries are interested well, in how many have been achieved And really unless and until we fix our choice. internal environment, we may not benefit All right. from those let's global to, Let's go to uh, right. Dr. Matthew now. Uh, Dr. Garba Shewu in that statement, credited to the president, also talked about the, uh, the reason for the executive order is being that it's to prevent compromise of investigation, uh, prosecution and, and the trial processes. Uh, but then you wonder really, because if you're to prevent all of this, uh, how does preventing these people now that we do not know uh, from traveling get this done? Because if you want to get effective prosecution, you say they shouldn't, get, they shouldn't travel. And like the barrister already said earlier that these people originally even reside in the country, they don't even reside outside Nigeria on one side. And how will this be effective again if all the monies they've allegedly embezzled and the property they've built from the embezzled funds are not profiled, all of them have not been discovered? It means that at the end of the day, these alleged people will still be able to allege, you know, allegedly be able to you know, subvert justice, <laughs> corrupt the system. Yeah, um, like I said before, the the, the whole media publicity around this media, um, travel ban is just an unfortunate distraction from the intent of the executive order. Um, once the court had declared that the executive order was valid, we should have gone forward towards the proper and objective implementation of the order. The order itself does not make any mention about banning people from traveling. However, banning people from traveling is part of the mechanisms put in place to make sure that accused persons do not go out of jurisdiction. 
I do not still understand what was the exact intent of bringing this whole media attention towards banning 50 people when you don't release the list of the 50 people objectively, and now we have leaked list all over. And like I said, it's distracting from the intent of it. What I would want to say, though, is that there is no doubt that when you see accused persons come to court and being defended by five, six, seven senior advocates of Nigeria, there is a definite need to ensure that they do not use resources that are mm. alleged stolen to frustrate those processes. And we should now move forward to seeing how this exempt order would achieve its intended purpose by making sure that, for instance, the exempt order says that the Atonjira should publish from time to time the measures that are taken under the executive order. So this is what we should be asking. Current under the executive order, yes, we provided a list. What are the assets of these people for the list that you provided under the executive order? We need this sort of proper and objective and no media-based uh, implementation of the order. This is an unnecessary distraction to the whole process. All right. We think uh, all right, Dr. Dr. Matthew, yeah, due to time, due to time, we have to leave it here now so that uh, we can just, uh, because we have just a few minutes before we go, just, just, just about four minutes now. Mm. Uh, uh, Jida, let me, let me ask you this. Going forward, what do you think, what scenario can play out? Because I understand some uh, lawyers have gone to court to challenge this. I think the executive should focus on the executive arm. Mm. And like George Washington did, why don't you direct these others at those who have entrusted with these agencies mm. to come and show their performance Absolutely. profile? The president, whom I respect so much, came out to say that the Inspector General of Police disobeyed his order in Benue State, mm. and yet that man is still in office. Mm. So I think the crisis of the executive resides with the executive. Okay. And I want to conclude this morning by saying that if position outperforms opposition, opposition will crumble. Right. And on that note, I want to say, can governance be shifted to the three cardinal objectives proposed for governance by the Constitution, mm. protecting the people, providing for the people, yeah. and creating an enabling environment. So okay. right. God wow. bless Nigeria. Amen. 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 That's, a, that's a, <laughs> of course, that's okay. God bless Nigeria. Thank you very much, uh, Maestro Jide Ologun, for coming on the program. Thank, thank, you. thank, you. thank you. And uh, we also thank you, Matthew Aye Baruko, uh, Director of Research and Policy mm -hmm. at the African Network for um, Economic and Environmental Justice. Thank you so much for joining us uh, from Benin City. Thank you very much for having me. Right. And just before we go, we need to let you know that the views and reaction of our resource persons on the topics discussed on the program today are their views and have no connection with TVC News. We need to let you know that. Absolutely. And we must thank you for spending your morning with us tomorrow. We'll be back again with other issues that concern Nigeria, Africa and, and the, the world. world. I am Mike Okwachi. And I am Aziza Tolalo. Have a lovely day.